Hello and welcome to the Linux Spotlight. This show is dedicated to showing off the best thing about Linux, our community. This community is made up of developers, distro maintainers, YouTubers, and everyday users. Each one plays a vital role in our community. And the goal is to have a discussion with each individual about their journey into Linux and beyond. So join me now as we turn the spotlight on. Hello, I'm your host, Rocco, and with me today is our special guest, Nathan Wolf. Nate, how are you, brother? I'm doing very well, thank you. So you are known as uh, many different names, um, Nate, uh, Cubicle Nate. Um, sometimes, I think once I saw Obstinate. That's true. <laughs> Appreciate and yep. uh, a few others. Uh, Open Seuss guy, you know. Yeah, my my green my my blood is green or something like that. I don't know. <laughs> well, um, everybody knows you, Nate, for your like infectious positive attitude about Linux, about life, about everything, and also you know with the open source thing, you know, you're like a walking billboard for them sometimes. Yeah, pretty much. Yeah, I I haven't got a T-shirt now. I'm not wearing it now, which because it's in the wash. Because I was just wearing it. I, I should have planned ahead. You should have. Yeah, no, I, I like to. Uh, <laughs> I, I I like the open Sousa. What can I say? But let's get to know you. Who are who is Nathan Wolf personally? So I'm I'm a father of three. I uh, I'm a I'm a nerd. True. I'm a true uh, nerd through and through. I turn everything pretty much into a geek sport. And I, I like the uh, old retro technology. I like, I, I like, I like technology. I like. I, I actually I was thinking about this question a little bit, and um, I, I think I don't like technology. I just happen to like little bits of technology, and Linux happens to be a part of that. You know, old computers and and video game systems happen to be part of that. Because uh, uh, I was watching somebody play a PlayStation Four, and I'm like, I don't like that technology at all. That requires the internet. That's that's terrible. Why? Why can't I? Why can't I just you know blow this off and stick it in and and call it good? You know I. So that's <laughs> no, you can't do um, that. So, no, it doesn't doesn't work like that. Requires the internet. Um, yeah. So I, I think I, I found that I'm 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 picky and choosy about the technology that I like, and I'm very enthusiastic about that technology. And um, yeah, that's that's kind of that's kind of me. Very nice. So, what hobbies do you have outside of Linux, dude? <laughs> So I have several, and that is a problem. Uh, so, so sometimes I kind of, I, I always like Linux as kind of the core. Uh, I would say my hobbies revolve around Linux, if that makes any sense. Uh, I guess so. That. Well, for instance, I, my, I would say my, I'm a, I would say I'm a Linux and I'm a fitness geek. I, I like all things fitness. I, I, I'm, I work out six, seven days a week. Sometimes I miss a day here and there, and so uh, everything from you know, lifting weights, mostly body weights. Now I, I work out mostly from home at this point, but I, I pick up a tractor tire so I can do tire flips in my backyard. But what's fun, what makes it a geek sport is I like to track everything. I have a spreadsheet. I'm actually working on an app. Eventually it'll be a Linux application. Uh, I, I got to get the time to do it. And there's other, I have other steps beforehand, but uh, cause I don't like any of the applications that are out there, any phone apps. They're, they're terrible because you don't actually own your data once you put it in there. And that just doesn't work for me. I like to have my data. I want to be able to download it into a you know, comma separated values. But anyway, so yeah, I, I love I love all things fitness, and and also I, I experiment with like with supplements, and I, I do control tests to see how different supplements actually affect my ability to work out, my recovery time, and everything else. And I run a lot too. Uh, I um I, I think I've I, I'm in the military, and we have a competition this next October. Who will do score the best on the uh, on the physical fitness test? And I'm one. I'm actually now one of the older guys. I'm not. I'm not a spring chicken anymore. So, but I, I do tend to beat the young kids, and it's not because I trip them or do anything nefarious. I just happen to, uh, you know, push a little harder. Now I suffer for that later on, but I'm I do sure. have to push. <laughs> well, thank you for your service. I appreciate that. Um, 
What is it that you do for a day job? So I work for Whirlpool Corporation, the, the number one manufacturer of home appliances worldwide. It's a global company. And I do, I'm in the advanced design and innovation area. And so I do, I'm a CAD guy. I do, I do design. I'm a product designer. So I do a lot of, uh, currently it's been a lot of fixture design, but it's been everything from interior features to mechanical components to structures and everything else. I, I tend to go more toward the structures than anything else. So, so how does uh, your daily job look like? You, you actually start designing structures or what? Well, uh, it, so I work with a team of engineers. I, I'm a one designer among many engineers. So the requirements come down. So for instance, that, uh, right now they need to test uh, adhesives. And so they have to have a controlled method of testing these adhesives. And, and so I, I designed a fixture along with an engineer on how we can, different ways to test the strength, how much shearing force they can actually handle under different conditions. So some is just a, uh, just testing its mechanical maximum breaking point, and then also testing under different environmental conditions and so forth. And so that's, that's what I'm doing now. So, so they'll say, hey, I need to do this. And then I'll be like, okay, well, I'll come up with a design that'll satisfy that. So I'll come up with a design and like, well, I need those springs bigger because I need 600 pounds, not 200 or whatever. I'm like, okay. So I change the fixture. It's all done digitally first, all in, all in CAD. I'll change the fixture. I'll find some other parts that have the right, um, <clears throat> that can satisfy that, compre- like the, whatever specs there are. So I'll, I'll look for parts. A lot of times I'm just pulling from McMaster dot com, which they have their they have their industrial supply house, and I'll look for springs or components that I need, and then how much compression I need. So I'll design the fixture around whatever whatever amount of compression is needed, and so forth. So it's um very technical. Yeah, yeah, it is. It's not very computery, and and I run and I do most of that on Windows actually, which kind of hurts me a little bit. But don't uh, you like uh, want to install Linux on those computers or what? <laughs> <laughs> yes, I do. <laughs> uh, so the the system, the CAD machine I'm using right now, it's an HP. Um, it's a ZBook. I'm looking at it right now, it's a ZBook, and it's it's a very well spec system. The keyboard is terrible. It's like the worst laptop keyboard. I think I think H, you know, HP needs to work on their keyboards. They're not like Dell's, but it has a lot of horsepower. Although it does it does run Nvidia, so that's you know, whatever. Right. Now that's a plus, dude. <laughs> oh, is it? <laughs> that's a plus. Um, so even in Windows, the the NVIDIA graphics drivers seems to they they, they periodically when they come back from like a sleep mode, they kind of um, they kind of kick themselselves a little bit. Uh, it it'll start to kind of fall apart, and I have to kill things and restart things. It we don't, we don't talk thing. about that stuff, dude. We don't. We don't uh, well, talk yeah, about the bad know, things. But um, <laughs> right, exactly. Actually, I have less problems with the, the Nuvo drivers on an old Dell than I do with the NVIDIA drivers on this new. HP, so well, whatever. But um, yeah, no, I wish I could install Windows on. I mean, Linux on there. I, I've actually started the process of of uh, I'm building a uh, a reason that we can uh, run this software. I'm gonna try to give them a a test plan, basically, like like an experiment to see can we actually run this software either like in a VM using like PCI pass through on a Linux machine and see if we could actually improve performance or or whatever. And and I have a there's some reasons why as far as like being able to juggle two different instances of the CAD software. So I can, uh, sometimes one will start to crash or start to fall apart. And so I can actually transition to the other one fairly quickly, or I can actually do more comparisons and such without having to deactivate and reactivate different CAD parts. There's, I, I could actually ramble about that for a long time. So I, I don't want to go too far down that bunny hole. Cause it's, it's going to get kind of stupid real quick. Well, I mean, Mm -hmm. we're going to go into your software later uh, (laughs) so that we can definitely run down that rabbit hole. Um, But let's talk about your username, Cubicle Nate. So where did this come from, dude? That's actually kind of a funny story. (laughs) Tell us. So years ago, 2007, 2006, 2007, 2008. When I was in Iraq in 2008. So I used to be in radio. Believe it or not, I don't think I have a very, I'm not like, I don't, I don't feel like a radio person, but I have a lot of friends in radio even today. And when I was in Iraq in 2008, I would call back to a, a radio show for the station I used to work for. And the, the DJ on there, uh, Jason Lee is his name, he would call me G.I. Nate. And so I'd call him periodically from Iraq and tell him, you know, what's going on, kind of the, 
the, the, the soldier, the non-politicized soldier story. This is what life is like in Iraq. And so it was kind of a, a reoccurring bit for that, for that year I was in Iraq. And so I became GI Nate. And then uh, years later, so 2014, I, he, uh, when I got the job at Whirlpool and I left, working, I left the Army full-time, he said, well, hey, you know, can't call you GI Nate anymore, so uh, I think we have to call you cubicle Nate, because now you live in a cubicle. And I was incensed. I'm like, wow, I, went, I really dropped from you know, being something you know, kind of cool, GI Nate, to cubicle Nate. That's, no, I, thought, I took it as an It was actually it was an insult. It really was. And then I decided to embrace my insult and become my own insult. So <laughs> there you go. So that was kind of fitting. Yeah. And so most of the stuff I do is, you know, in a cubicle. And uh, although my, where I am right now, this is my, my workspace. I keep it pretty dark because I don't like, um, I don't like bright lights. The, um, I kind of call it my super cubicle because it has everything in it that I want minus a 3D printer, but that's coming later. Uh, has all my old tech, my CAD stuff, my other Linux machines and uh, a test box I got working out behind me. We can talk about that later. Yep. Um, I think we'll just add GI Nate to the list of names we call you. Oh yeah, we can call it. Yeah, that's fine. <laughs> I'll have to wear a hat for that, I think. <laughs> all right. Um, and uh, well, you recently started a podcast of your own, right? So that sounds really pretentious, but yes. It's not pretentious. <laughs> you started a podcast on your own. I, I have a podcast. I'm a podcaster. Um, <clears throat> so yeah, I did. It's so part of it is is practice. Uh, I thought I'd start doing that just kind of to kind of uh, just to you know practice speaking again, like you know presenting and whatnot, and and you know I, Biddle. I, I I calculated out. I probably talked maybe all of maybe five five to ten minutes in Biddle. You know, because there's a lot of people, and and so. I thought, well, I'd like to maybe, you know, work on that, work on my presentation skills. And then uh, also uh, what, what I'm turning it into is, is kind of a, you know, post biddle. I want to have like my uh, additional thoughts that maybe I didn't get in a biddle to kind of like kind of dovetail into, a, into that and just kind of be my own. So if somebody cares to know what I think, they can, you know, they can listen to that. And also nobody really talks about my, my favorite distribution. I think, you know, Michael does, Michael Tanell and Tux Digital. He talks about OpenSUSE from time to time, but they're doing a lot more things that, do, that don't actually hit his radar. So I want to just focus in on things that I really care about in OpenSUSE or, or in the Linux or tech, tech world and, and just kind of expand on that, you know, bring attention to the, the stuff that, you know, has me smiling from ear to ear pretty much. Well, this podcast is called Cubicle Nate's Noodlings, right? Yep, stuff that's kind of noodling around in my noggin. Or if you can think about it like noodling, you know, the sport noodling, how you catch catfish with your arm in the, in the, in the riverbed. That's, that to me is kind of like how the thoughts happen in my mind. It's kind of like a, a random catfish latching onto, you know, somebody's arm. And, you know, it's kind of a real hillbilly thing, I guess. But um, yeah, that's, that's, kind of, that's kind of how I think about what goes on up, you know, rattles around up here. Well, there will be a link in the show notes for that. And uh, I suggest everybody go subscribe to that podcast because uh, the first episode was pretty good, dude. I think the second one was kind of dry. I, I listened to it. I'm like, well, I'm not going to reread this. It's kind of dry. <laughs> Look, <So. laughs> the first and the first couple episodes are always rough in your own mind. You know what I mean? But when somebody else is listening to it, it's not quite the same. So, and I think that, that you be. would probably be that kind of person that might be rough on yourself. That's quite possible. I, I, I have been known for that. Yeah. All right. Um, now, you know, you run Linux and you work at Whirlpool and you uh, have to run Windows there. But uh, in your local area, whether it be friends or people at work, are they receptive to Linux? Yes. No. Okay. <laughs> Let's talk about that. So I... Uh, at work, I, I work with a bunch of nerds. I mean, engineers, and a lot of them actually know Linux very well. Some of them know a lot better than me. They, they're uh, the the um, the different labs. They use Linux in different ways, actually, already, in in the forms like Raspberry Pis or things like uh, for data acquisition uh, systems. And so, a lot of these these uh, these systems work better on Linux than they do in Windows. So. Uh, 
much of the tracking, the lab tracking, at least it has been historically, they may, might have changed that, I don't know, uh, has been running on Raspberry Pis running Linux to, to kind of keep everybody organized, keep the labs on track and, and, and so forth. Uh, some of the, there's a lot of Arduino stuff there too, which is, which is funny. There's uh cause Arduino is kind of also a hobby toy thing, but there's industrialized Arduinos now, which is pretty amazing. And they have, uh, which they're not Linux, but, but they, but the, but there's a lot of like different odds or strange, you know, on, uh, uncommon to the, 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 uh, com the, the consumer market, uh, things there. And so, so Linux is not, you know, weird to people. It's, it's fairly common. Now, not for everybody, but actually, I, uh, funny you should say that too, because there was a conversation I was having with an engineer on Friday. So I was irritated by my, <clears throat> my Windows system doing strange things. And he says, yeah, I don't know why we're not running Linux. He said, that would make life so much easier on here. We're already using Google, the Google suite for everything. I said, it's just one step further. All the software exists. This is, I'm using open source software anyway to do my calculations. I don't understand why we're not using Linux anyway. He says, see if you can figure out how we can crack that code. I'm like, deal. <laughs> That's awesome, though. Yeah. <clears throat> to be honest with you, dude, I think you're the first person that I've talked to uh, on this show that has that type of answer where there are a lot of people that are receptive to Linux, not as far as, you know, running it, but at least open to it. Because most oh, yeah. people are like in an area where, you know, the people that they're involved with directly you don't even know what Linux is or even want to talk about it. So I also have a Linux stuff at my church too. I set up a, uh, for the kids' church, like a media computer running, of course, open SUSE Leap because, of course, why not? And then I have a Raspberry Pi that that does like kind of announcements. It rotates, you know, it doesn't it, it? Just has a little FTP server on it that the office lady can log into, dump the pictures on. Which sometimes I have to redump them on for her. But one of these days we'll get it all, all, all squared away as far as how to use it. Uh, although Ryan Dosky, he did give me another application I should try from what I'm using now to run on the Raspberry Pi. So I, I might give that a whirl. That might, that might improve things. We'll find out. And then I'm working on a, a lighting control computer. So right now the, what controls all the lights is, is an old Windows XP machine. And quite frankly, it's old. <laughs> and it would definitely dying. be better suited for Linux, dude. Yes, it would be. It'd be suited. Kind of, well, it's, it's a 30, even a 32 bit, Windows XP machine, like the machine is that old. So it needs to go, I have the machine. It's actually a retired office computer that's there. I got it mostly set up now and I have it, I got out of an industrial uh, cabinet, like a automation cabinet, a, a, a 40, 36 inch, I think, a touch screen, uh, screen, like a giant screen that, uh, so that we can actually control the lights and everything, you know, with, you know, with your fingers and whatnot. It's, it's a really, it's, it's going to be a nice setup when it's all done. And now it's just a matter of me actually setting it up. And also I set up a PFSense box there to control all the, um, the network. I unified the network there. I've actually noodled about or blathered about the, all these, these goofy things on my, on my silly website too. You got a lot uh, going on, dude. You got a lot going on that you're, you're like into a lot of different things. It's because I'm a little bit into a lot of different things. <laughs> <laughs> it's hard to stay focused sometimes. Well, you have a, a long history uh, with computers um, because okay. talking with you on Biddle uh, about different subjects, that subject comes up and uh, the stuff that you mentioned. But where, where did you start with computers? What was the first computer you used? I have it ready. I had it ready to go for this. <laughs> this is the, the, the Commodore 64 was my uh my first my first love in computers right here awesome and, uh i think i was four or five so we're talking early mid 80s I, I don't remember exactly when but it had i mean it had a, you know the floppy the five and a quarter inch floppies on it and really obnoxious floppy drive that you could start a game go upstairs port, like i can remember, i can vividly remember on a saturday morning like i wanted to play this game called racing destruction Great, great racing game. It probably is still my favorite somewhere, but I have rose-colored glasses, and when I play it, it's not quite as much fun as I once thought it was, but it's still, right. I still like it. It's still going to be, you know, it gets an honorary position for me. But um, 
I, you know, start the game and then I would go upstairs, pour myself a bowl of cereal and, you know, come back downstairs. And just as I, you know, I'm, as I've had a couple of spoonfuls, it would be done loading by then because it was such a slow loading system. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, and actually the, the, the sounds I can actually, especially remember in the, like in the summertime, I didn't, you know, play as much on the computer, but in like in the wintertime when it was cold or rainy, like on a cold and rainy Saturday or morning or something like that, you know, cranking up the, the Commodore 64 and, and there's a kind of a warmth to the sound that disk drive makes the way it kind of purrs as it's seeking to get data off of it. It's, there's still something kind of very nostalgic about that sound and uh, it sounds really silly and I, I kind of want to kick my own fanny just for saying that actually. <laughs> Well, you know, it's been mentioned before about uh, nostalgic things, and for me, sometimes there are there are nostalgic memories, but I don't know if I'd want to go back and use those on, on a regular basis. You know what I mean? Like we have it good right now. Oh yeah, for sure. I I did purchase for this computer a uh, this Commodore sixty four. This is a little Ethernet adapter. And I don't know if you can kind of see that. Uh, yep. It just plugs into the little expansion port in the back. And what is exciting about this, I can't work on it right now because I have a bunch of other things I got to take care of first, is I, I'm, I've downloaded the software. I need to compile it and make it work and build the images. But I want to be able to do all my IRC chatting on the Commodore 64. So it's, <laughs> and and I, there's actually a lot of things you can do with it still because people keep developing on this thing. Just for the nerd credit of, hey, you know, I'm talking to you right now on a Commodore 64 in this IRC room. So yep. <laughs> that, that's, that's really the only reason why there's, there's actually, it's not practical at all, but just for fun. So, <laughs> yeah, just for fun. I can't say that would be fun for me, but Hey, more power <laughs> to you, brother. Um, yeah. So walk us through the history of your, your computers after that you started with the Commodore 64. When, where did you progress then? So I was in the Commodore 64 until I think it was 1992 when I got the, the, my first Commodore Amiga. It was Amiga 600, which I was excited for. And I didn't know better until maybe like three years ago that that was the worst Amiga ever made by some people. I thought it was great. I don't know. Um, this little guy here. Is it plugged in? No. This, this little guy right here. Uh, it's actually smaller than the Commodore, the Commodore 64, but had, you know, Upgraded that three and a half inch floppy, man. Yeah. That was that was something special right there. And it had like, I can't remember how much each disc stored, because it wasn't a standard PC. But it was that was an exciting time. And then later the uh, um, here's where things get a little fuzzy on me because I can't remember. But it was then then I went to the Amiga twelve hundred, which I still have, and an Amiga four thousand, which I got in nineteen ninety seven. Amiga four thousand. And then it was about that time that the Amiga died. I suppose, well, I mean, I won't say it died. It, it basically went to the witness protection program, I think I would say. Because <laughs> it still exists now. There's still like the Amiga research operating system and some other stuff out there that, that's actually really cool. And, I, I, and, and there's still development happening on it. People still release games for it and everything. But really? It was, uh, yeah, yeah, they do. Commerce 642. In fact, I just bought, not too long ago, somewhere here. Well, I don't know what it is. Um, actually, I just bought from the 8-bit guy. He had this Planet X2 for the Commodore 64. And it's, so I, I bought a, you know, the, the whole floppy disk and everything. And he's, so there's people still producing applications, games mostly for these old systems. And they're actually, it's amazing what they're doing with like how they're squeezing the extra bit of performance out of, out of these old you know, antiquated systems. That's really astounding, actually. So... Uh, yeah, I want to support those people. You know, I don't play the game very much. I like it, but it's it was more I wanted to support the idea of you know we're we're keeping these old things alive and kicking. Yep. Well, I remember you know the floppy drives and then they go to the zip drives and like each step you took was better than the last. Um, but you always had that old stuff around, and I just oh, I mean yeah. I had that I had my floppy drives, I had all of that stuff around until a few years ago, and I don't know what happened to it. I wish I still had that stuff laying around like you do well they so when I joined the military in the early 2000s, all this stuff kind of got boxed up and put away, so I only actually pulled it out of mothballs like in the last couple of years, so the um 
So after the Amiga died, or yeah, well, here's a Planet X2. Here's a, here's a look at that. <laughs> that is a beautiful piece of history. Well, not that old, really. Beautiful piece of history, though, and technology. Um, so after the Amiga died, and let me want to back up there for just a second. On the Amiga, I got into programming pretty heavy. Uh, I actually made a game, I actually made several games, and one of them I did kick out there like freeware. So I was into free software before I knew it was a thing. Uh, and <clears throat> it's, uh, it's called Gator Mania. It's not important. Don't look it up. Uh, but anyway, I noticed on, um, on YouTube, somebody was playing a game that I made as a 17-year-old doing like a long play through the entire thing. And I thought that was pretty cool that somebody found the game and played it and so forth. That was, uh, was kind, of, kind of funny. I found two videos actually, but one in particular. And, uh, and those, the frame rate, frame rate's a little bit lacking in it, you know, things like that. It's, and there was a, some, there was a grammar error in one of the things <laughs> I did. So, you know, good job. <clears throat> but it was, it was kind of neat to see that somebody. But you made it and somebody's it. using it. Yeah. Which, which, you know, for shame on me that I haven't really gotten to programming more so in the, on the, on Linux. Cause Dude. I think I'd have a lot more fun doing that. Dude, you don't got time for that. I, yeah, <laughs> I, I should make time. <laughs> You know, there's that, that there's a, there's like a seven hour chunk every night that I could probably reallocate. Right. Who needs sleep, dude? <laughs> That's right. <laughs> so <clears throat> after the Amiga kind of sort of fizzled out, then I, I bought my first uh, Windows 98 PC. Now my dad had a, a Windows 95 machine that I helped support, which I thought was miserable because it always had problems. And so I developed a dislike, a visceral dislike for Windows in like the 95, 96, you know, era. So I got this Windows 98 machine, and it was it was an it was an AMD machine. So you know, go Team Red. It was a uh, was a something six AM, AMD six or AMS. I don't know what it, I don't remember the terminology. I don't remember what the what the, the nomenclature was, but it was a whopping 333 megahertz K62 processor. That's what it was, and uh, I thought, wow, this thing is fast. This is amazing. I don't remember how much memory it had, but then I did got into some PC gaming at the time. But I pretty much actually. I, uh, my love for computers and technology totally just fell off after, after that. Like I was just, I didn't, I actually didn't really even care about computers for about a four, like from 98 to about 2002. And I just didn't really care about computers anymore. Actually. Like I just didn't it's like, whatever I'm done. I have, it's not fun anymore. And, uh, well, what got you back into it? Oh, uh, so that's my, my, my first Whirlpool. I have two Whirlpool lives. My first Whirlpool life started in 2002. And I started, because I, I went to, the, I decided to go into the design, you know, mechanical design area at uh, field. And, and I discovered this thing called Unix, HP Unix. And I'm like, this is really cool. It is, it has this, this terminal and I can do things in the terminal. And like the, the, the IT guy, he was just a, a just a, like a wizard. He would do all the, like, there's a problem, which didn't happen very often, but he would just go in there and he'd do all these things. Like this text goes flying by. I'm like, this is great. <laughs> what is this? Please tell me about this. How can I get this? How can I get this HP Unix? And he goes, there's no, you need to, uh, you check this thing out called Linux. Linux. You know what? I have heard of Linux. It's a penguin thing, right? Like I just, I heard about it in the past, but I kind of dismissed it. Cause it's like, you know, I don't know. It was too complicated. It was a red hat thing. It was too complicated for me. Cause I was using Amiga and, um, and so I, I, I dusted off that old K62 machine and I, I put this thing called Linux on it. It was Mandrake Linux it was 2002, right before I deployed to Kosovo, I think. And, uh, and I, and I'm like, wow, this is great. So I, I tried this thing called Gnome, I'm like what a silly name, but I'm going to try it. And, and there's something about the menu structure that I'm like, mm, I don't like that. This, this, it was just, it wasn't intuitive to me. So sorry, I apologize to anybody who, who thinks I'm wrong. Uh, you, can, you can send your complaints to you are wrong at cubiclenate.com. Um, and, then, and then I tried this thing called KDE. And I'm like, this is, this is what I want. This is kind of like the Amiga Workbench in some ways. And it, it has some kind of Windowsy feel to it, which I'm comfortable with. And it has these, virtual desktops, which is like that Unix thing that I really like. So it's kind of like all these things together that I, I enjoyed about computers all smashed into one, you know, maybe not smoothest desktop, 
but it was on Mandrake Linux. Uh, I forget the version number, but I actually bought the box off the shelf in a store. And, and I, I thought it was just absolutely fantastic and I loved it. And then I didn't touch Linux again for nine months. <laughs> so what you're really saying is Linux is what you got, what got you back into computers. Yeah. Yeah. It, it, um, <clears throat> I felt like, and I started, I have, I have a, a series that I'm writing on, on Biddle, the Biddle, um, um, blog about how Linux make puts personal back into personal computing. And I really felt like when, when I, went to windows 98 like it wasn't personal anymore there was nothing i could really do with it sure i could i like these a few different options that were pretty anemic for customization but i had no real it was, like i felt like it wasn't mine this this wasn't mine at all and uh and so i just didn't just didn't care and then this this kde linux i can remember what kde version it was was it three two i don't know but it it had this feel of like I could do whatever I wanted with it. I had all these different themes. I could make it whatever I wanted. I, I could change how things were. I'm like, wow, this is this is like my computer again. Okay, I can't play games on it, but I don't care. <laughs> that, that's really what it, what it boiled down to. What is this Tux Racer? Oh, this is fun. That Tux Racer. Uh, yes, the, yeah, Tux Racer. I don't know what it was. The, the downhill penguin one. What, what's, yeah. I think it's yeah, Tux that Racer. one. <laughs> yeah, Tux Racer. Still, my kids love that game. I, I do, I do, uh, have machine i let them bang away on that that has it on there well you mentioned some of the positives you about <clears throat> those first experiences what were the what were the negatives because there had to be some so a game that i enjoyed on the pc in, in the pc world a couple of games they didn't work at least not initially uh, i don't know if you've heard of descent it's like descent one two and three mm -hmm. uh, and and i became a fan of descent three this is probably like 99, 2000, that came out. 99. And I, uh, I don't know why I said 2000. But, um, and I really enjoyed that game. It was a lot of fun, although it really pushed the computer beyond what I really, what it could really do. And, uh, but I couldn't play those PC games on Linux. I didn't dual boot though either because I, I really didn't have time for playing games too much. And I kind of fell out of the, uh, the game playing thing for the most part. Uh, I didn't even didn't play console games or anything. I was I was more into uh, into playing with automobiles at the time. So, so did you stick with Linux from then on? Sort of. So I had a nine month break. So I, I deployed to Kosovo in two thousand three, and the Linux thing was kind of ringing in my head, the excitement for Linux. So I didn't get to play with it while I was there, but I read everything I could about it whenever I had the time. And I started doing, I actually started really actually getting into, uh, um, so my job is in the Army of Civil Affairs. And the way we stored information was a little bit crufty at the time. Like there wasn't like really a database. It was kind of a collection of documents. And so I, 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 I literally hand generated a an HTML document that they could actually then I could organize and sort all the information with that. Compared to what we do things now, it's total garbage. But at the time, <laughs> it was very useful to a lot of people. So when we had our uh, our continuity books, we handed off to the next team that came in. They had a nice CD with everything linked together, and then an, and then a, like a three ring binder with a lot of relevant documents about you know stuff that we were doing. And so. Uh, yeah, so so we I that I I became known. That's actually it was a mistake because I, I joined the army. I didn't want to have anything to do with computers or technology because I was very tired of it at the time. I didn't didn't care anymore, and uh, so I wanted to avoid any association with me and computers at all at that time. I was trying to avoid any kind of connection. So I, I but I got kind of annoyed at the way we we're organizing information, so I just kind of did it, and then I awesome. just kind of started me down a path. I'll say. <laughs> no. um, how about, um, is there other programs that you've like developed for that type of scenario or for other types of scenarios? So I didn't really, I haven't really like develop anything necessarily uh, like with Linux uh, outside of like some scripts to like make things easier. That's really all I've done and utilize all the tools that are existing in Linux to make doing my job a lot easier. But other than that, not not really. So, but uh, it was actually end of 2003, right before I 
I bought my first laptop and it came with, it was a Sony Vio, terrible machine. It was a piece of junk. Uh, but I bought that and I installed Linux on it immediately. Like I totally, <laughs> this is 2003. This is before Linux was, you know, ready. Yeah. So this is before Wi-Fi. There was no Wi-Fi. So I had to get the wind modem working in it. That was a struggle in and of itself. Uh, but at Mandrake, Mandrake Linux, getting that going. And that's actually, I learned to use Linux while in Iraq in 2004. So man pages and everything else, that's actually when and how I learned Linux. And I would occasionally get some internet time so I could actually ask questions on the Mandrake forums from <laughs> middle of the desert, Iraq. <laughs> awesome. So, yeah. And I, so when I became acquainted with open office and actually I did, I did a lot of my report generating in open office, you know, and, uh, back then that, that was before USB keys were a danger. So I could, you know, plug a USB key. Oh, it was a little bit crufty though, too, how that all uh, USB keys worked at the time. But yeah, that's that, um, produced a lot of documents in open office. So when is uh, it that you get home and you get to play with uh, Linux more often? So that'd have been January. Uh, wait, no, that'd have been, uh, I think, November of 04. And it was pretty much full speed ahead on, on all things Linux. I played, uh, played with Debian quite a bit at the time. Didn't care for the installer. It's better today. <laughs> it's a little. Yeah. It's, yeah. I mean, I miss the Encursus, you know, um, uh, tool set or whatever they would use for that. But no, I, 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 anything I get my hands on, I was installing Linux just to see if it would run, see what I could do with it. And then uh, I think about that time I got my first Wi-Fi card. That was like 2005. That was a headache because I had a Broadcom. <laughs> um, got it to work. I can't remember how even it, I, I had to like, like rip, I like rip the like the Windows driver. Like it was a really, really crazy way to make that thing work. But I got it working. So, and then uh, sitting, and pretty much just you know at some level I had been using Linux ever since then. Like it, it, I never, I never actually went back to installing Windows or using Windows. So from 2000, basically from 2000, end of 2003 onward, it's been all Linux for me. That's pretty awesome, dude. Yeah. So at what point do you see the light for OpenSUSE? All right. So let's see. <clears throat> Mandrake became Andriva. And then to, um, so I went, went, went back to Iraq in 2008. And then um, sometime, I mean, actually, I kind of tried OpenSUSE from time to time um, after that. Like, like my dad, he was having so many problems with Windows. I put I open SUSE on his machine because I couldn't get the modem system to work. Oh, I could share with Yast because Yast has always been awesome. I could share the modem connection and I created like a, I turned his computer basically into a router use it without using open SUSE. And, and so I could, then I hooked, how did I do that? Yeah. yeah then I hooked it up to like a little switch because it's still before, um, no, it was a hub. It was a, it was an, it was an ethernet hub before switches. Um, so I hooked the computer to a hub so I could actually use the internet connection through his computer you, through a dial up modem, uh, <laughs> using open SUSE. And so actually I had, I kept him on open SUSE for most of that time because Mandrake couldn't do that as easily because open SUSE just made that all just made it work s super well. And then when, um, when Mandriva started kind of dying in witness protection program, uh, right. in 2011 timeframe, some weirdest thing happened with the company and then the, there wasn't any new updates coming down for, for uh, Mandriva. And so I started, that's when I started distro hopping again. So I, I tried Ubuntu, I tried Kubuntu, Mint, uh, there were a bunch of others. So 2000, I tried in 2010, I tried, actually tried OpenSUSE again in 2010. I didn't, I stuck with Mandrake, Mandriva. It was 2000, end of 2011 actually when I jumped over to OpenSUSE because none of the others really satisfied what I wanted. I wanted a, the, the K desktop environment. And, uh, and nothing else had a nice build of that. So that's, that's actually what, that's actually what got me on open SUSE. So. So you, everybody knows you're the open SUSE guy. So do you do any distro hopping? So when you say distro hopping, what exactly is it that you mean by distro hop? Well, I mean, I don't consider, <laughs> even though I test out, 
distros. I don't consider myself a distro hopper anymore because my main machine is Pop! OS and it's been that way and it stays that way. So I test out distros on a laptop or on the test machine, but I don't actually distro hop anymore. I've been cured. I see. So you don't have distro hopitis or no. hopperitis? Hopitis. Hop hop <laughs> <clears throat> yeah. So after hopping, hopping around post Mandriva and then uh, between Mandriva and OpenSUSE, I couldn't find a good KDE distribution or plasma. I think I called it plasma at the time. I couldn't find a good plasma distribution that also had a great control center, like because the Mandriva control center was really awesome, not as good as Yast. Oh, oh actually, I'm going to step back a little bit. So when I was on Mandriva, I did a lot of like snapshots and helping the Mandriva team kind of copy some things from Yast way back in, also in the, in the mid 2000s. Um, <clears throat> so I wanted to find something else like like OpenSUSE that had the same kind of, or I'm sorry, like the Mandriva control center. And basically, I, I could only find OpenSUSE that fit, fit that bill at the time. There's probably some more now, but yeah, it was the only that really fit the bill. And so I could do everything very easily, you know, set up at that time. I think I probably had like a, a, a NFS network file share for my house and, and also like FTP and you know stuff like that. Samba was easy to set up as well. So that's, I, I want all those tools because I don't really want to have to mess around. I just want to click, 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 do what I got to do, put it, punch in some information and then be good to go. And then you know, I wouldn't have to dig through config files unnecessarily. Right. Well, um, let's get into the specifics of OpenSUSE. You love that. You love OpenSUSE as a project. So oh, yeah. what is it about OpenSUSE that, that you love that you go from being a regular user to contributing to the project and even going so far as applying and running for a board position. So that story probably starts in 2013. Um, when at the time, uh, about 2012, 2013, 2012, the, uh, the, the U S army was shifting from having everything password based using a, uh, a smart card to be able to access military sites and the instructions out there were either incomplete or had missing bits of information or were really overly complicated and i'm like this is this is kind of terrible so i said i'm going to i'm going to write my own instructions and then i and then since i the open had a, had a wiki at the time i said I, I actually got on the forums and said, hey, can I, how do I go about um, like setting up instructions so you can, so I can you know, do, uh, make it easier for people to install this smart card or, or DOD CAC system? Uh, and then, you know, I, I didn't, not quite a, an RTFM, but hey, we, if you go to this site, this will teach you, tell you how to do it. Like, oh, okay, great. So um, I went there and I said, all right, so this is, I, I went through all the, uh, uh, you know, the, this is how you do it. These are the rules and so forth. And, and I set up a page that had all the instructions on it. I did it basically for me because I, you know, I forget things really easily. I've been, you know, had my, had my egg scrambled a few times. So it's, it's good to have, you know, all, everything written down. So I, I, <clears throat> I made a page. I, um, you know, submitted it, whatever, and, and committed it. And then, uh, started like interacting with the community a little bit more over there on contributing to the, to the, uh, the forum, uh, the, the wiki pages. And that led into, I had a problem with Java, the open Java or whatever it's called, the uh, ice tea. Yeah. Yeah. You know, didn't have, it couldn't access the, the defense travel system with the ice tea stuff. Uh, so I had to use the genuine Java. So then I went through and like, well, how do you install genuine Java? Because I pulled that from all the repositories a few months or a few years prior, perhaps. So I went through and I, 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 the job instructions were difficult for me. I'm sure they were not difficult for everybody, but for me, because uh, I, I think I operated in eighth grade level is kind of what I like to say. So I, I, like, I like my instructions step by step by step you know, that I can actually explain it and teach it. So I went through it and I rewrote the job instructions as well in 2013. And then it just kind of went from there. I just kept doing more uh, because it was easy to do. There wasn't, um, some distributions like Mint don't have like a wiki that I can contrib contribute toward. And at the time, and maybe it's changed now and I haven't really looked, but Ubuntu also didn't really have a wiki 
that I could contribute toward. And I really liked the idea of a distribution that actually has a repository of, of information that wasn't Arch. So, um, <laughs> ah, obstinate just came out. <laughs> Go back. Um, so I, I, yeah, I started basically, I just started kind of contributing in, in that way. And then I just like, as time went on, I kept doing, you know, a little more and I just kind of became more and more entrenched in, into it. And then I was actually only uh, about three years ago, what year is it? 2019. So two years ago, I got a computer that wasn't NVIDIA that I could run the uh, OpenSUSE Tumbleweed with the snapshots and everything else. Uh, and, and actually that, that pretty much cemented in my, so I would say two years ago is really when I was cemented in the absolute love for OpenSUSE because that allowed me to, um, so I like to mess around, but I, I need the reliability of, of something that I don't have to mess around with. So if I want to mess around, I want to have that freedom, but you know, really I, I have a lot of work I have to do and a lot of things that I do with in Linux that keeps my life straight. So I, I want it. So, oh, so when I'm, why do I use OpenSUSE now? What, what is the main reason? Is the it it gives me the freedom, or it gives me, it gives me the stability and security of of a system that that I can count on, but then it also gives me the freedom to be able to muck about without the consequences of having to reinstall and reset up a system. So when the time comes that I I actually screw it up, which will happen, uh, because I do from time I get like I bet I can make this better, and you know I don't know what I'm doing, but I can. So once I once I make it better and yeah. then it breaks. I can roll back to that previous snapshot very easily. And it's like, it never even happened. So, so it gives me that freedom to, I can do whatever I want and not really pay the consequences. You know, it's kind of like ibuprofen. (laughs) Uh, Well, okay. So you're submitted into OpenSUSE. How do you then get to the point where you apply for the board position? Well, um, I think, that was the beginning of this year, early 2019. Uh, they, they, they did a call out for, for people and, and nobody really responded initially, I, I guess was, was part of it. And I'm like, well, you know, I'm not, I'm not smart enough and I don't really contribute enough to the, to the, to the, uh, the project said, but I'm going to throw my name in the hat just to have a name in the hat. And, and because I do like the project and, and I do like to, um, I do like to talk about it. I, I like the project, a, dude. <laughs> I, okay, well, maybe maybe it's a little bit beyond that. Uh, maybe it's a lot beyond that. Um, maybe it's almost of an unhealthy level beyond that. But, uh, <laughs> dude, uh, look, <laughs> I would have loved to seen you get that board position because there is nobody in the Linux community that is more passionate about their choice of distro than you are. I mean, this is beyond being, you know, this is beyond fanboy stuff, beyond that. It's, it's that you can see and feel the passion you have for open source, open SUSE, And it's absolutely amazing to watch. Well, they do a lot of really amazing things and they don't really get a lot of credit for it. Um, you know, even like their open build service, which <clears throat> I'm still learning how to use that properly, but um, I want to get good at it at some point in time, but I'll talk. That's, that's another, that's another topic later. But, uh, so they, they, they're, uh, they're open build service along with like open QA and, and actually still a lot of projects that use the open source infrastructure for, for delivering software at, um, you know, because they build for other projects. So it's kind of like a, it's a very, um, I feel like it's a very, it's, it's, a, it's kind of like a meritocracy, like a very welcoming, you know, Hey, you can do whatever you want. Yo, you want to build for Arch? Yeah, sure. Go ahead. You want to build for Debian? Yeah. Okay. Go ahead. You want to build for Ubuntu? Yeah, that's fine too. You know, go do, do whatever you want, you know? Happy trails, you know, go forth and do great things. That's kind of how I feel like OpenSUSE is. And if you also notice, there aren't any real forks of OpenSUSE either. Uh, there was one a few years back, but it ended up just kind of folding into OpenSUSE. Like it didn't, because OpenSUSE is so, you know, uh, yeah, you can, you can yeah, as long as you're within certain guidelines, so you can pretty much do whatever you want with it. They don't, they kind of don't care. It's like, you know, great. You know, and I, I like that kind of a feel to it. So you don't have all this, fragmentation within OpenSUSE because it just doesn't, it doesn't really exist. You're not to say, say that it's perfect. You know, I'm, I know there's some members in the community that, that probably have some rough edges. I know that there are, <laughs> but you know, I mean, I think any community has got the, the, um, 
you know, the grumpy old man, you know, I mean, it's everyone's, everyone's supposed to have one of those, you know, at least one, you know. Well, what do you think of the recent, and I won't say that split word, we'll just say the recent changes in SUSE, uh, in Open SUSE, and like uh, Richard Brown stepping down, and we got a new uh, uh, chairman. So what do you think about all of those recent changes? So I think Richard Brown, he, he actually held that position longer than anybody before him. And it's kind of a high, I don't want to say high stress, because I don't really know if, how stressful it is. You have to ask him that. But I mean, there's a lot, there's a lot that that position does. And, uh, and I think his, I don't know for sure, but his, he definitely has other passions and hobbies too, like photography. And he, he's, he likes coding. He, the, uh, the, the Kubernetes, the micro OS, OpenSUSE, which I guess is the third, distri- third OpenSUSE distribution. Uh, it's kind of a passion of his. And I think he, I don't know for sure, I'm, I'm just speculating here, but, but based on what I, I read and, and what he's talked about in the past, I think he, he kind of wanted to get more down to the, doing the technical stuff than the people things. So I think you can get you can get burned out doing a you know being in a being a mouthpiece for a very long period of time. Uh, as far as far as like the I think we're probably going to like talking about the separation of the open SUSE from SUSE. Right. So I'm on all the mailing lists that really hasn't been talked about very much as of late. And so I don't know, it's just being discussed. There's like no there's no commitment to it. It's just being discussed. So I don't know. I could be wrong. But I've not read anything as of late that says there's, there's, there's like no anger or tension. I think the issue is, uh, so when, uh, I think when attachment was purchased by, um, uh, micro or something like that, whoever the, one of the, one of the fish gobbling up the other fish, gobbling up the other fish that was going on with, with, uh, Sousa. Yeah. There was a there was a point where all the funds were frozen and OpenSUSE had no funds to to run one of its uh, conferences and so I'm not sure how they solved the problem, but that was a that was an issue and so the conversation started out from my recollection that hey we want to be able to have funds that we can use, you know, separate from the corporation and so then it kind of came down then it, then the, it progressed into well if we're going to have that separate maybe we could have a little more autonomy. And it wasn't really anything conclusive that came from that last I last I read, and I haven't read in a few weeks on it. I haven't seen anything pop up in a few weeks, or that caught my eye. There's a lot of traffic on the mailing list and so forth, but I, I don't think he stepped down in in relation to that. But again, I could be wrong. I I don't I don't know for sure. It's not like Richard Brown and I were, you know, we're we're, we're tight or anything like that. You know, and we hang out and we have all these private chats. It doesn't that doesn't really happen. Although he did tell me after that election because I'm, I'm jumping all over the place because that's how my mind works. He did say I got like 25% of the votes. And he says he hopes that I run again next year. Very so, nice. That would yeah. be awesome, dude. Yeah, we'll see. Let's get back into uh, Linux. What is your daily workflow like? Is it <clears throat> Do you have a software or a hardware type workflow where you need certain software or you have like you're a keyboard driven guy or a mouse guy? <laughs> So I have to have, I find, I have to have Plasma as my desktop. <laughs> and actually that, how I use Plasma has changed thanks to you and Regolith, Regolith on, on the, the i3 desktop. So I, I've now actually changed a lot of my desktop control to not, not being exactly the same keystrokes, but now sending windows and uh to different desktops and also jumping to different desktops and also I'm not gonna say tiling necessarily, but yes, kind of tiling. And so that's actually changed how I've used the computer a little bit. Cause I can be a lot more efficient. I can I can like sp- like split a window very quickly or or just run it really quickly across to the other screen just by quick keystrokes and everything. So can, I can do like really neat interaction now thanks to my time on, on Regolith that uh, I'm like, wow, how can I incorporate this? And then Michael Tanell he said, hey, check this out. And so I checked it out. I'm like, whoa. Um, <clears throat> and so I changed some things, how I use the desktop because of that. Um, but as far as like applications that I use, so if I'm not using um, the Windows machine for CAD, which, you know, here, um, I have, when, when, I'm in, when I'm working my home, my super cubicle, 
I have my, my laptop, which is you know sitting right here in front of me. It has two screens that are attached to it. So it's a dock station. I curt chunk onto it. Then I have my desktops and, and, and so my other, other screens that are, that are above. So I can actually see everything we're talking about right here. It's really nice, actually. Um, <clears throat> and then I have the applications that I use the most right now. And you know, some people are probably going to be like, oh. but the uh, KDE personal information manager called contact. Which really? I like, I, I actually, I went, okay, this is a little extreme. This is definitely hyperbole, but I basically live and die by that application. Like, like I need that. That's the only um, personal information manager that I've ever used that actually does everything I wanted to do. I, I wish you could do a few more things and use a little bit fewer on the resources. But aside from that, it does everything that I want. So uh, I, I home educate my kids. And so I, and I work from home a, a lot. And then I have a, uh, a lot of like activities and like, like school community things. Like, so like my kids are one of the other homeschool kids on specific days. And then I have to plan for th th that time. And then I have like, you know, there's dance and there's swimming and then there's soccer. And so all this stuff is plugged in there. I have everything planned out until pretty much the end of the semester now. So I do all that in contact, which syncs to a Google calendar. Uh, so that, uh, which, which by the way, I, I really need to put that back on the next cloud, uh, but there's reasons I can't right now, which aren't important. Uh, but <clears throat> so it syncs very nice with next cloud with a, uh, with Google actually does better with next cloud. Next cloud's way better, but it syncs Google. Uh, and then I have that then synchronized to my other main computer that has these, the calendars and such, which is upstairs in the kitchen. So I can actually do all my work on like, as I'm multitasking, waiting for my, uh, for the parts I'm working on to regenerate, which sometimes takes a long time, I jump to the Linux machine and I work on other stuff. I do a lot of my admin things here. So I also, I manage information for the project I'm on at work. And I do all that in Linux whenever possible. So, because like the, the way Windows handles Windows is pretty terrible. Like it's pretty terrible, actually. It, it just doesn't, it's very slow and kind of clunky. So I can actually set things up better here so I can actually go through when I'm, when I'm documenting stuff for work and, and, uh, and linking stuff together and, and so forth, I can do that very quickly and very easily in Linux. And that's, a, that's actually generally like, it's like my virtual desktop number four is where I do all that stuff, all my work stuff there. And then all my school stuff is on either two or three, depending on what else I have going on. And then like any of my cubicle mate nerdy things are on either two or three, which, which everyone basically stole that for that, you know, that day or whatever. And uh, so that, that's, so when I'm, jumping from task to task, I can very easily hit, you know, control F1, two or three or four. I can jump to whatever desktop that I need at the time to get working on whatever I need to get working on. So. Well, with all that jumping around between, uh, you know, Windows and Linux, as far as from work, is there any software that you would like to see come to Linux that's not available? There's two, but one primarily is if PTC who makes the CAD application you use called Creo. If they were to build that for Linux again, because they used to, well, it was called Wildfire at the time, that would be, that would make my life all Linux all the time. Like there would be no reason to start a VM except for my second application should be TurboTax at the end of the year. <laughs> um, I need a VM for that. But I can, I can deal with a VM for one time a year. But if I had PTC's Creo on Linux and I could convince my employer that I can run on Linux instead of this Windows business, I, I would be 100% complete and I would, I would never touch Windows again. That would be an awesome day, huh? That would be. And, and, and actually, it, Creo, or called Wildfire at the time, uh, I cobbled, this is like mid-2000s. This is before I had a career change. I, I actually cobbled together a machine at Whirlpool to run a Linux instance that had the CAD software on it. And although it was by all rights, not, it was not set up for CAD at all. Like it was not, did not have the horsepower whatsoever. It actually ran the CAD software way better than, uh, than windows did at that time. Like it actually, it was stable. It wouldn't, it wouldn't be all crashy. It didn't do all these strange, you know, things that, that I have to deal with now on windows. So I, I just think that, you know, if, if just that one, if it's that, that one little application, that would basically make my, my work life so much more efficient. 
and I think I can make a case for that. Like I think within work at work, I can make a case for that actually. So, well, um, I usually ask about, um, different things uh, about marketing in Linux in these series. But let's, let's go with another word. Do you think that Linux is bad at promoting itself to people that aren't or don't know about it? So if I should say that, I use the Linux distribution. It's probably the worst at promoting what it does. <laughs> <laughs> um, that's how the Germans are. They don't, they don't tell themselves too much, I guess. So um, I think, you know, I, I thought about this question a lot. Every time you, you bring this up at, at, at all the other uh, spot, Linux spotlights, I thought about this. And I think, I think, yes, it does do a terrible job, but not entirely. I, um, I almost don't think that companies should promote Linux, if that makes any sense. Well, I mean, I, okay. I mean, they have to make money. So however, however corporations have to do that. But so I, I think that as, as members of the, the grander Linux community, I think we need to promote it, not, not like browbeat or, or whatever, but right. be, be very willing and to say, hey, I use Linux and this is why. It may not work for you, but it works really great. Hey, look at this guy. He, uh, this, <clears throat> this guy, Rocco, he likes, he likes Linux. Check this video out or whatever. Or Hey, look at this. This is me running Linux desktop. And people ask me questions all the time. You know, how do you run that? Can you help me run that? And so I, I'll help people. In fact, I just had somebody who I once lived locally. They're like, hey, I want to get started with Linux. Um, how, how would I do that? And, you know, I'm racking my brain. Well, OpenSUSE, of course. And I think, you need to try Linux Mint. <laughs> <laughs> because you live too far away for me to make a trip over there. But I've set many people up with Linux. In fact, there's like this 80, 80 plus year old lady in my church who, uh, who, who said, what is it that you use? And uh, I says, well, I use Linux. She says, can you give me Linux? I said, is this something you really want? She says, I don't want to have problems. I said, well, you're going to have problems with everything. And uh, anyway, I ended up giving her open SUSE leap on a, on a new HP um, laptop with you know with nvidia drivers and i showed her what kd connect and worked with her android phone and she is absolutely enamored because she can start and stop her videos from her phone and and she just absolutely loves it and in fact like her her phone got an update and broke kd connect so she brought her laptop to church and said you need to fix this because i i gotta have the phone talking to the computer <laughs> and I just had to re it's just I just had to repair it, and it was good to go. And I showed her how to how to pair it again. And so now she just loves it, and she tells me, eh, not every not every weekend, but pretty close to it. Oh yeah, it's working great. I love it. Thank you so much. So, um, you know, she's she's eighty some years old. If she can do it, anybody can do it. Right? I was gonna say it's amazing that somebody at that age would be excited to use, I you use software like that. Like you wouldn't expect somebody to. Uh, want to use a, a piece of software that would connect your phone to your computer. It's just, oh, no. that's amazing. Yeah. So I think she likes, <clears throat> she likes Chrome. So I, you know, I wasn't going to fight that, you know, right. she's already familiar with Chrome. So I just put Chrome on there and it just, the updates ha you know, the updates are all handled by package kit. Everything just works for her. And uh, she just doesn't have problems. There was a little bit of a learning curve for about three weeks in the beginning, but how do you do this? How do you do that? Once it got past that learning curve, she hasn't had any issues and she loves it. And, um, it, you know, she may not have to buy another laptop again as long as she doesn't drop it, you know? I mean, because all she does is watch, watch videos, a little bit of office stuff. And I can't see why it would, you know, a laptop with a, with a, you know, a, an eighth gen i7 is going to require anything more powerful. I mean, I don't, I don't see why she need anything more powerful until it, uh, the thing dies. So. But you asked me about uh, why why I run Linux, and you know I always say the community is the best reason to run Linux because our community is such a, a tight knit group. But there's also other great reasons that may be just as important. You know, uh, open source software, uh, the flexibility, customizing. You mentioned a couple of reasons why you uh, started. Uh, running Linux, but what drives your passion 
for running Linux. So besides a community, uh, it, it would actually be the, my computer is my personal computer once again. I, mean, I told you like in, in 1998-ish or so, I lost any, any like for computers because it was no longer mine. I, I had no, I lost, uh, the computer had, its, had lost its personality. It, it was just, it was just business. It wasn't fun anymore for me. And so Linux made computers fun again. It made it where it's, <clears throat> although in some ways it's a little bit more boring today than it was. Okay, it's a lot more boring today now than it was you know, 17 boring years ago. Boring in a good way. Yeah, you know, I mean, yeah. I mean, because Mint is boring, but it's boring in a good way. Yeah. Um, I think OpenSUSE Leap is boring, but boring in a good way, which is why I went to a rolling distribution because I wanted it to break. And then I'm kind of disappointed just, by you that. You just like the excitement. Yeah, I want. Yeah, I want like a little bit of like you know. I I want to I want to be important to the computer, right? <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, oh, yeah. So it's, it's the fact that I can make it my own. Like, you no, know, for instance, I I use Plasma because I can make it literally my own. I I I told you I just I changed a lot of the key the key bindings, the global shortcuts, so I can do new things with it that I learned that I didn't even think about before, which I never would have thought about had I not got involved with your community and, and, and did these different distro challenges. So I had like, I was expo ex, uh, exposed to another idea of interfacing with your computer. I'm like, you know, I don't like everything about that, but there are a lot of things I like about that. So I can assimilate that into my own workflow to make, make me work better. And the fact that plasma allows me to change things so easily to fit what I need. Oh, and by the way, I can export those settings and I can, I can send them to another computer very easily. Very nice. Um, which I did. The two other computers. But I, uh, <clears throat> I can now, I, I can make them my own. I can make it for me and make it work the way I want it to work. And I don't, you know, there's, I'm not beholden to any, anybody's, you know, design philosophy, you know, to how, how I should use my computer. And that, that to me is like, is like number two. Actually, it's, it might even be almost more important than the community because, you know, if I lost the internet, I still have my computer, you know, right. but, um, but it's, it's, so that's, that's very important to me too. The other thing is like having control over, over my data, how I store my data, how I manage it, like my data internally, I can, I can I do that all without, you know, without fighting anything just to be able to use, you know, use things the way I want to use them for me. So like for instance, um, sync thing, is a wonderful application for keeping my data synchronized. And although I do use Google Drive somewhat, so don't tell anybody, keep that a secret. I use Google Drive um, for a lot of things uh, to share data with other nobody people. Nobody will know. Yeah, it's, yeah nobody, will, nobody will know or care. I, I use SyncThing for most of my data. So I, can, I have uh, three computers right now that are actively synced. So anytime I make any changes to something, they all will synchronize. So if my main computer blows up, which it shouldn't because it's a Dell um, and it's not 2006 anymore, I, I should, um, I, all my data is on the other two computers. So if any one of those go, I can just resynchronize that if, the, if a drive fails or whatever. So I have everything backed up. And then, I, then actually, then I pull weekly offline backups as well. And it's all very easy to do with, with software that I, you know, that, are, that are in, it's integrated in with my, my Linux environment. So, so I have control of my data. I don't have to worry about you know, paying for license for anything just to keep my life running. You know, so like, <clears throat> you know, if things are a little bit tight or whatever. I don't, you know, I don't have to, you know, shell out a bunch of cash for something that, you know, is unnecessary. You know, I don't have to, I don't have to buy Norton antivirus anymore. I don't have to buy, you know, that's a lot. That's kind well, of almost me. every program in windows. Yeah. So you mentioned earlier about your, uh, about uh, experience in forums and whatnot. So we used to have like this really bad reputation around Linux uh, for not being friendly, not being welcoming. Um, it's improving, but give us your experience overall since you've been using Linux uh, with the community and how you've been treated and maybe what we can do to make that experience better. So I've never had a bad community experience in Linux. I don't, so when people say, like toxic members in the community. I'm like, who are these people? I don't know these people. They're, they're uh, I mean, maybe some gruff people, but I mean, <sighs> okay, nerds, geeks, 
we're all socially a little bit inept. I mean, we are. I mean, I'm, I know that I am at times. And so I never read into people, what people wrote on the forums, but like most of my community life was on the Mandrake forums and then later on the OpenSUSE forums. And <clears throat> I was never really into the Reddit, subreddit, Linux subreddit. So I don't even browse it now because those aren't the people I want to talk to. Because uh, if, if I have a question, I'm going right to the OpenSUSE for it, folks. And they're all, they've all been super friendly. And, you know, when I, when I first started in OpenSUSE, I got in the forums with my, um, <clears throat> my previous to Cubicle Nate uh, username, which is Future Boy, but I'm not a boy anymore, so it doesn't seem to fit anymore. <laughs> um, I, uh, <clears throat> they were all very welcoming. They're like, hey, welcome, you know, whatever you need help with. And then I had questions about like how to get a different pieces of hardware working. And they were always, it's always been extremely helpful. And I've never had a bad experience, you know, and I contribute to the forums too, whenever I can. A lot of those questions are over my head. But, um, but I mean, like in the Discord or in the Telegram for OpenSUSE, yeah, I try and help out as much as I can with people. And there, it's, I, I don't really see any bad eggs. So, so when, when people say bad reputation in the Linux community, I, I'm like, you know, what part of town of the, what part of Linux town are you hanging out in? Because <laughs> it's not, it's not something that I see in my, uh, <clears throat> in my uh, side of town. You know, with the cul-de-sacs and the. I should have hung out in the open SUSE forums <laughs> more often. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I like. I think um, I think maybe for a while there was some toxicity in like the Ubuntu forums, and I think when they switched over to Unity, there was like a lot of whatever. But I never really was subject to much of that. I I read some of that, but I didn't really key in on it because why would you use anything other than Plasma? That that was always my thought, and uh, <laughs> um, or KDE or whatever. I don't even know when that was. I can't. I don't even know. Um, but but no, I didn't. That's not. That's not a a thing that I, I know of. And and any any Linux users that I know personally that live around me, or that I've worked with, or or in the army, they've always been like super friendly. And so it's it's never been. I, I've not really experienced a a negative anything in the community. Well, that's awesome. Um, I'm glad that you haven't. Uh, I think maybe part of that is because of your outlook on things. Um, but let's run with it. So yeah. do, you, do you do any, uh, uh, you know, let's put it this way. Do you have a favorite project that you worked on? Because I know that you worked on projects as far as uh, different little things, scripting, um, little coding here and there. So do you have a favorite one? So I don't really have like a favorite coding or scripting project. I've done lots of uh, scripting for things, none of which I would call my favorite. One was just a... Uh, before sync thing and before like cloud services, I would synchronize two different Linux machines uh, over a network using like a secure shell and, and like doing R sync. And that was pretty cool when I got it to work. But um, that wasn't really, really complicated. Um, I, I think my favorite projects right now in Linux is going through and like documenting other projects like, like like i really i don't know why i nerd out by documenting things i blame the army and i blame my parents <laughs> um well you're um, you're helping uh mx Linux right now are you not i i am and and so uh, actually this last week like last couple of weeks uh, dolphin he he said he said what do you know about app armor i said well it works great in open susa why and uh, so we had a conversation. He says, "Well, we're gonna they want to integrate some app armor things into MX." And he says, "Can you set something up, kind of a simple, you know, uh, something so we can, I can kind of get people on board of what how to use app armor?" And my experience with app armor has actually been very little, uh, except when dealing with snaps. This is a few few months ago. I, I did some bug reporting with app armor and snaps on OpenSUSE, and uh, that got resolved. <clears throat> so that's what that's actually my the extent of my experience there was just, you know, was that. And so I spent the last week reading a lot of documentation on, on uh, App Armor and kind of boiling it down to something simple that I put on the MX, MX Linux uh, wiki pages so they have something they can work with as far as that. Now, I'm still, it's not kind of still in, pro in process, so it's, it's not done, but I have stuff that says, how much more detail do you want? If not, we can break that out maybe in a separate, you know, kind of uh, separate details. So this might be too much right now. And so we're, we're kind of, we'll work through that. But yeah, 
I get excited documenting things. Uh, I, I, um, it's actually about a year ago now, a little over a year ago. The uh, next cloud it was actually after listening to an ask, ask Noah show, they're talking about next cloud. And I thought, and I'd set it up in, in open SUSE several times, but I hadn't really, I didn't really look at the documentation in it. So I, I, I rewrote and update all the documentation for open on the open SUSE wiki for next cloud and the lamp stack and everything else just for fun. And, uh, and now I maintained that. And then I, I actually ported all those over to the MX Linux site as well. Oh, they don't have next cloud for it. So right now it's just the lamp stack piece of it until they, you know, oh, um, some packaging has to be done for next cloud before we can, I can do that for MX. But, um, but you yeah, know, I enjoy that. If, if it can help, if I can help somebody figure out how to do these things, kind of empower them to have control of their own computer. I feel like that's a huge win and it's, it's fun for me. But see, that's an important piece that gets, uh, you know, people, uh, Projects will say how people can donate, donate their time or donate money or whatever. Mm -hmm. Documentation is always listed, but I think it's the most overlooked part of a distribution where they need that help the most sometimes. And that's very important because not everybody can lay out something in a simple but yet or informative way. And that's an art to do that. So... <laughs> Well, I had been forced because of my time in the army to write reports to an eighth grade level in a certain voice. I forget what they call it, uh, actual name of it, but in a specific voice. And and so I kind of got kind of like doing that, you know, writing these writing reports. Who likes writing reports? <laughs> I don't. You do. I think that might be, you, you do. That might be the most insane thing I've said all day. <clears throat> but um, so I I enjoy that. I just kind of start translating that to into my in, into my geek life. And, and I, I know I just, I, I, I enjoy it. And I like making clear, uh, things clear that are, that are unclear. And so that, that's, that's my favorite thing to do. I, I think if somebody reached out to me, you know, either on OpenSUSE or MX, whatever, for anything specific, yeah, I'd jump on that. Cause that's sometimes I don't really know what I should jump into. That's probably my, some of my problem, but, I, but anything like that I work on or that I need, and that's not clear, I'll just, I'll clarify it. But uh, I, I would love like, that's that's for anybody who watches this. <clears throat> you know, you know, I would I would gladly jump into something else to help out with documenting because it's it's just it's a fun thing to do. Well, maintaining software, dude, is uh, sometimes difficult <clears throat> uh, depending on which distribution you're on. <laughs> but you do run into problems on any distribution. At some point, you're going to run into issues. Um, you mentioned bef through this whole interview uh, situations where you worked on, you know, years ago with uh, the Wi-Fi cards and you know getting internet to work and stuff like that. What what's the what's the one thing that went wrong that you fixed that you were just super excited about? So <clears throat> years ago, there was this thing that I bought. I never should have bought it. It was dumb. It still is dumb. But this. USB to DVI converter. I was I just played with it again. I don't know why it's, but so this is like 2012. Uh, I I couldn't get this thing to work. I went I wanted a third screen to on my system, and and so I, I bought this thing to see if it would work. And that's actually when I first learned of Wayland, and that was gonna that was that was, this is 2012. That and next year it's gonna be released. We can use Wayland. So. Yes. Um, to replace X. Yeah, that was 2012. <laughs> so it was, how can I use this as a, another display so I can, because uh, what I was doing, I was doing, um, I was working with Uncle Sam and there's a lot of, a lot of documentation that I was doing, not fun documentation, terrible personnel, database management stuff. And, uh, and I wanted to make it as myself m operate more efficiently, which interestingly, um, the U.S. government doesn't always necessarily want you to operate more efficiently. I, I just want to throw that out there. They sometimes frown on it, and I don't understand it. That's a that's a total side. So I, I used to be an administrator. Um, data, I did like personnel and database management with the army, and I used uh, I had I had my Windows machine there, but I also had uh, the network would go down all the time. Like I just I would show up, I'd drive an hour to work, I would show up, and like we well, can't do anything because the network's down. I just drove an hour here. Why don't you, I, I wouldn't have come in if I couldn't work. Like, well, you know, we're going to hang out. I'm like, well, what do you mean? <laughs> and I, I, I don't want to hang out. So, and I had my Linux machine with me 
And so over time, I developed what I called WolfNet. I could do everything on WolfNet at work, that, well, almost everything, except for a few different, a few functions um, that required the, to be on the uh, RNet or the Army's network. So <clears throat> I, I could do, I could process all these things I could do just over the internet. And so I, I, was, I was able to uh, scan and process all these documents using open source tools, which I probably shouldn't be saying this, but it's okay. Um, uh, and I was able to process and upload all these documents into these Army systems very efficiently using all these different little Linux tools. I was using OpenSUSE, of course. And, um, and so I became very efficient. So I was the one, I was the administrator that was always able to get things done no matter what. So if the, main, so if the regular network went down, I had my backup network. And so I would just run and do things because I could. And I put things in batches and so forth. And um, so anyway, back to, I wanted this piece of hardware to work so I could actually look at something else. I knew it would be the, the, the USB 2, so not very fast, but I didn't need anything that responded very quickly. So on the OpenSUSE forums, I, I said, hey, how do I get this thing to work? It recognizes here. And it was like over a period of months of like back and forth and, and messing with this and that. Because you know, I wasn't like working on it all day long, but I got this thing working. And once this thing was working, it was amazing until an NVIDIA driver came down and broke it later. So <laughs> <laughs> it was amazing for a very short time, but it was, it was, it was amazing for about six months. It was about eight months of work to get six months out of happiness out of it. But yeah, that, that, and, and you can look up, if you look up um, USB to DVI, uh, like display link or something like that, uh, and then open SUSE, you'll, you'll find, you'll find all that, that nonsense, which none of those instructions are any good now, but you know, whatever. <laughs> well, let me, let's take it a little deeper here. Where do you think uh, Linux is headed? So what do you think of when I say you're the Linux desktop? That was 2003 for me. I think that, uh, so I think Linux, your Linux desktop is a personal thing. Uh, and I think that's 2003. But where do I think it's going? So this is just me. Uh, so in the, in the hacker and maker space, people who build things, do stuff, I think Linux is going to continue to grow there. And I think nothing's going to really, you know, slow that down at all. Uh, I think you're going to, uh, like, <clears throat> like right now today, if I were to build my own like CNC router, because I, I, like, I like the special machine stuff, um, you can do it. There's actually Linux CNC that exists out there. It's fully, I mean, it's, it's pretty well documented, which that could be something I get involved in later. Who knows? Uh, so if you want to build like out of you know, commercial grade parts or industrial grade parts, uh, a router based in Linux, you can do that. And I don't see that slowing down. You know, things like, 3D printers and such, they all kind of use that same base of controlling the G code and everything else to, to, to do, you know, to build physical objects, you know, be, be it a, a CNC router, a 3D printer, or a CNC lathe, <clears throat> or combinations of there. And I think that that's going to continue to grow. I, I think, and what I'd like to see is something like, well, of course, OpenSUSE, because I'm biased. Of course. Um, but I like, I'm not going to lie, I'm, I'm biased. I, I like think they're the best. Um, not perfect, but if they were to actually maybe sort of target this this area uh, a little bit more, <clears throat> and and so what I mean by that is, I don't say create a distribution, but maybe some. You know, actually, I could do it if I really wanted to. Now I think about it. So now, now I feel guilt because I haven't done it. But <laughs> but actually, to create distributions, or in the case of like uh, of OpenSUSE, it could be like an auto yes packaging or and scripting, or or just even a meta package that you could download. That would just install all these components, so you can do things. You know, you can be you can slice, you know, slice 3D objects and, you know, do, do CAD work. Like FreeCAD is a great application that runs on Linux for doing, you know, for doing CAD. Um, and, and all these other, other tools that exist out there and start targeting that market. I think that's going to continue to grow because, you know, the, the Raspberry Pis and the Arduinos of the world, they're not getting smaller and less significant. There's a lot more of that. And it's, it's moving into other hobby spaces too, like, like Christmas lighting. You know the Christmas lights to music. Yep. There's a program called X Lights that that runs on Linux, and uh, there's uh, which is it's on a list. I have to do it here shortly before Halloween hits. But there's a um, you know there's like, there's like multicolored RGB strands of lights. Yeah, and they have like there's a um they have a little module on there that's controlled by a remote. 
Well, those are all standard protocols. In fact, that's what I have up here. It's kind of a, a light, just an LED light strip. And those are all standard protocols. And that really just requires like an Arduino, you know, a little bit, a little bit of a, a little bit of hacking. And then you have you put a little web server on that. You control the lights any way you want with it. I, I don't think that's going to go away. I think that's going to continue to expand. And um, I kind of, I mean, I don't see Windows going away. I don't see Mac going away. But I, and I don't necessarily see people saying, oh, I use Linux. But I can say, I can see people saying something like, you know, you know, I'm a, I'm a hacker or maker or whatever. And I, I use, you know, this, you know, whatever that, you know, Linux, but probably some other name. And I, I see that more or less growing. And, and the fact that like System76 and Dell and other, other companies are shipping Huawei now too. Um, can we talk about Huawei? Sure. I don't know. But they're, yeah, they're shipping Linux now. I mean, they're, they're um, so if, if the Linux desk, if the desktop was dying or being less relevant, I don't think all this emphasis would be, be going into things like the desktop. You know, because people are not everybody's a consumer. Not everybody just uses a tablet or a phone. There are people who create things, and that's never going to stop. And I think that over time, not exclusively, but I think over time, Linux is going to continue to grow in that segment. And and I think as people learn to make and and do things and you know self empower, I think that Linux is just going to be the natural fit for it. And they're not really going to think about it. They're not going to think about oh, I'm using Linux. They're just saying they're just going to say this is the best tool for this job. So this is what I'm going to use. And, and, and I don't see, you know, it's going to change, but I don't think for the worse. I think that it's going to continue to get for the better, for sure. Yep. Uh, I don't have any idea of what it's going to be like, but I do think that uh, it's going to be for the better. Um, you know, from a retrospective, <laughs> if you look like how has Linux changed in the last, when did you start really using Linux full-time, would you say, or mostly full-time or large? Uh, two thousand. Uh, just off the top of my head, two thousand five, two thousand four. Two thousand five. Okay, so let's say you know for the last fifteen years. What would you say would be the biggest change in Linux for you? Well, I don't know if there's a for me specifically. I would say um, just the fact of the the ease of use of it. So okay. uh, the setup of it. Just being able to go from point A, which is wanting to put on a Linux distribution, to point B of actually getting it installed and using it, the ease of that has come so far to the point where you could install and have a Linux distribution set up in, what, seven minutes, eight minutes, sometimes 10, where mm -hmm. before uh, it was not that way. <laughs> I mean, it absolutely was not that way. Yeah. So since I installed Windows back in the 90s and played with DOS and everything else, not begrudgingly DOS, um, I never thought Linux was difficult to install. So I never really keyed in on that. But although when starting to do like the distro challenges, I would say the ease, the ease of installation is, I mean, if you're like, going, like from zero to 60 is, is almost instantaneous now. I mean, there's really not, you don't really have to think about it very much. And that I would say has been a huge change. I would say like the number one thing that's changed for me in Linux I would would be drivers. Like how the drivers are way better now than they were 10 years ago. Yep. For sure. And um and I I, I like, think I would add to that that the kernel has more in it to where where drivers are not needed anymore. You know what I mean? Where you used to have things that you need to add extra libraries right. for you now have it just working out of the box right that's true a lot of things just work now you don't have to think about it um but uh, but as far as like how much linux has really changed and shifted it's you know if i go back 10 years it's really not changed that much for me except except maybe there's more options there's more availability of of things there's Hardware compatibility is so much better. So I, I see that where, where, where it's going to change is probably better integration with hardware, better support. I, I don't see it getting worse. It's not at this point. Not if you got, you know, Huawei and Dell and System76, not necessarily yep. in that order, and doing all these things. That's, that's a huge, you know, that's, that's great. Well, going with that, if you could change... 
one thing about Linux, what would it be? That everybody was using OpenSUSE or MX. No, I'm kidding. That's that's not what <laughs> no, I think I at all. No, I do believe that, dude. I do believe that's what you want. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe a little bit. Um, I think the one thing I would say if I could change, and this is a bit of a hyperbole here, but Clippy. I kind of wish there was something like a Clippy for like new users and any and it can work with any distribution. I don't, I don't really care, but that kind of walks you through a little bit, you know, not, not so annoying that you have to keep closing him to get rid of him. Like, like he was, you know, back in the day, but, but I was about like, how important was Clippy for what that almost 20 years on the, on, on the windows desktop that actually really helped people get acquainted with. This is how you do this. You know, can I help you can I help you. It was an, it was an agent right there sitting on your computer that kind of helped you an annoying agent an annoying that, agent that you kind of yes that helped you use your computer and, and i think that if there's one thing we could change in linux you know it doesn't be clippy maybe be clippy's you know you know uh grumpy cousin the stapler um that would just kind of walk you through how to do certain things you know like it's so like welcome screens um this is how you get started here any of these types of things that, that really walks somebody through. That's what I, I really wish we could change in Linux. So, you know, someone says, you know, like, like Adam Grubb's experiment with, um, with his with a roommate or friend or whatever yep. with, with, with Ubuntu, like, like she had, she had no idea how to do a lot of these, a lot of these things because there was nothing really to walk her through. And, and I think mean, that would be the one thing I would change. Cause if, if you can do that, if the hackers and makers, they're going to figure it out. That's not a problem. Yep. Um, Phones are ubiquitous and you can speak search and, and do all these other things. So you know, I don't really want speak searching. But anyway, um, I think Clippy, Clippy would be what the number one thing I would change. So, that so sounds you really want sad. Clippy for Linux is what you want. <laughs> Basically, yeah. That's exactly, that's, that's kind of what I want. Um, thinking back on all the reasons that you chose to run Linux, um, do those reasons still apply today? Yes, and even more so probably. In in many ways, this can be really nerdy here. Uh, let's push my glasses up. Um, Linux has become, in many ways, kind of like my happy place. It's I can uh, I can go to this happy place here that that I um, you know it it works for me. It's it uh, I I don't have to fiddle around with it. I, you know, it's got everything set up the way I want. I don't have to play. Um, you know, a screen roulette every time I dock my computer onto the station, like I do with my Windows machine. Like, you know, I don't know where things are going to show up, but things just kind of work and work for me. Like, I don't have to work for my computer; it's working for me. And um, and and yeah, like it's it's really it's it's literally it makes computers fun, enjoyable, and productive all at once. More so now than ever. Like like I, I would say. Working with Linux today, not only is it fun for me to work with it, with, work with it, and work with all different tools like you know Audacity, Caden Live, or other things, and, and and all these myriad of applications, but the fact that I can actually I can actually count on it. I don't, I don't have to think about is it going to work today? Is is you know, um, I don't I, I'm not. It's not going to have like the crazy Mondays like where you where you start at, where you start up your computer and you kind of scratch your head wondering like if it's going to come back to life or not. It's <laughs> It's really, um, computers are better today than they ever have been. Well, <clears throat> Linux is better today. Before. Yeah. <laughs> Linux is better today than it has ever been. Um, we are yeah. in a great time, dude. For sure. And, and the fact that things like Endless too, like Endless OS, you know, how that it's, someone took, took all the wonderful things about Linux and personal computing and is now introducing that into areas you know, of, of the world that don't have the luxuries that we do and they can, they can start to, to love a thing, this, this, you know, this black box, this, you know, flippy dippy thing with a screen and a keyboard on it. And, and it's, it's wonderful that someone got to express Linux in a way that can suit a whole nother group of people and kind of, and pull them in. I just, it's just, yep. yeah, it's, that's pretty great. Absolutely. Uh, is there anything else you want to share with people, dude? Sure. So I was I said a, a project that I'm working on with a, a member of the community that I met. I want to say in the Das Geek channel, uh, but he's also in the Tux Digital, and I think he's in the Biddle, and you know, much other places. So we started talking there. 
So <clears throat> I'm a big fan of PF Sense. That, that whole like you know set up your own, you know this is my own firewall router. And then I'm in my house here because PF Sense doesn't support 32-bit, and I have all these somehow somehow people give me hardware. It's really weird. Um, I built an IP Firebox out of some parts, and that's my my, my main router. So instead of having like a you know a, a Linksys router, I have this um, Dell Optiplex you know, Pentium 4, which is hardly even working. Like it doesn't doesn't even it doesn't stress at all to do my my network traffic. Well, I was just there's some things I that it just doesn't do that I wish it did, and the same goes with the PF Sense box that I manage as well. Uh, and it's it doesn't it kind of doesn't doesn't have some certain flexibility features to it, like you know like like Pi Hole. Are you familiar with that project where they connect yeah. you? It's a DNS. Yep. So if I want to add Pi Hole to IP Fire or or PF Sense, unless I set a I set a separate box, I can't do that, and that's kind of annoying. So I was talking to a guy in one of the one of the channels. I don't know which one it was. Um, and, and he's like, well, you know, you can do that with pretty much any Linux distribution. And I start, well, really, really. <laughs> and so we just started talking and we've been collaborating now for the last couple of weeks. And so we're actually building, well, he, he's smarter than me in this way smarter. So I'm working on some of the documentation, actually getting it tested and working, but I'm, so I'm building a box out of a 32 bit machine that uses tumbleweed, open source tumbleweed as my firewall router system. And, and, what I learned now, I love Yast that much more because I all those tools that I enjoy, like an IP Fire and, and PF Sense, they all exist in Yast. They're they're all, they're all right there, right. and then I can do that. I can I can you know SSH in and use the terminal for doing all that, or I can do the web admin, or I can do if I have it's if I has you know it has a screen on it, I can do it basically any way that I want. And then now I can actually I can have the flexibility of putting on whatever modules I want, like Pi Hole or whatever, right on the on the distribution. <clears throat> which is basically just an, you know, a firewall appliance. And I, I can do all these different little, what I think are exciting things for the, for my network. And then it, it'll continue to roll. I'll have all the capabilities and, and sa safety nets that Tumbleweed provides. And I can have all the additional features that I can't get with these other projects. So I'm, I'm not saying I'm a distribution maintainer because that's silly, <laughs> but I'm working on basically having a spin of OpenSUSE that you can install to run to run your home network, and so that's kind of my my current exciting project that I'm I'm working on right now. That is awesome, dude. Yeah. Uh, at what time uh, are you going to release this? The new distribution? Oh, well, it's not a distribution. <laughs> just... um, <laughs> so I'm going to start off with uh, once everything is set. I actually it's been about a few days since I've been able to touch it. But I'm going to put a wiki page up with uh, on the OpenSUSE wiki on how to do that, and then I'm learning packaging. And there's an I, there's Auto Yast which can do some scripting as well. And I'm not exactly sure how those two integrate together yet. But I want to be able to then actually have it so you can just install Tumbleweed, the server, and then install a package that does all these things automatically for you. And then actually, what I want to do is play with their Kiwi system, the 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 spin and ISO, so you can just Take, an, take a download it and then install it and it'll, it'll do everything for you automatically. So, and then I'll just try and have that. It'll be hosted by OpenSUSE. Uh, that's, that's the, that's a far reaching goal. Right. So, well, well, I'll expect the release very soon. I'll put, we'll, we'll try to get it working right. on DistroWatch. And... Yeah. Okay. Well, maybe, you know, I, I don't think it'll be that. I was like tumble fire. What would you call it? Like tumble, uh, fireweed. That doesn't sound right. I'm trying to think like, what would, I don't know what to call it. <laughs> Uh, yeah, we'll have to work Tumbleweed on the name. Fire. Yeah, Firewall. I don't know. I don't have a good name for it, which actually that's what's holding me back from actually putting a wiki page together for it. Um, but the documentation is pretty much set now and um, it works. It's just a matter of, I, I got, I got to make the transition to my, I just, I got to shut things down and make the transition to my house at some point in time. Right. But, uh, but yeah, no, it's, it's, it's a really neat, and actually somebody I just met, he's a, he's an uh, Italian guy that lives in Taiwan and he's a fan of OpenSUSE. What are the chances? And uh, <laughs> and so we, we've been talking quite a bit over Telegram and been working on this back and forth and, and so forth. So it's a it's a really it's a fun project. He's got some way cooler hardware than I do, though. I have like old jalopies. He's got like new hotness. <laughs> Dude, you are one amazing guy. I can tell you that. That's a lie I can live with. <laughs> <laughs> Um, how can, how can people get in touch with you, Nate? Well, you can, uh, I'm on telegram. I'm, I, I spend a lot of time in the middle 
Telegram. So you can pretty much if you if you at Cubicle Nate there, uh, you can email me at cubiclenate.com. Literally me at cubiclenate.com or actually anything at cubiclenate.com. You know, hey dirty bird at cubiclenate.com. It'll all get to me. Um, I uh, <clears throat> that's that's and I'm also on, I'm on Discord as well, so you can hit me up there. Also, Cubicle Nate, and uh, that, that'll probably be the, those are the best ways to get hold of me. Um, I don't. I'm on Facebook, but I won't admit that. But you can also contact me at Cubicle Nate there as well. So <laughs> we won't talk about that. <laughs> no, we'll talk about that. So not not in, I'm not in the Google as Cubicle Nate, except well, my I guess my uh, I do have a Cubicle Nate as a as a, a YouTube. Uh, you do have a YouTube channel. Yeah, yep. yeah. Mm-hmm. I, I wouldn't call it quite a channel. I, I've been putting some nonsense on there for sure, but nothing, <laughs> nothing. But, you've been, but the important thing is you've been putting on things that you enjoy. That's the important oh, yeah. thing. Yep. Yeah. Maybe, maybe someday when there's a little bit more time, you know, if I can squeeze out some of that sleep time at night, I can probably do a little more there as well. Nate, thank you so much for joining me here. This was awesome. Well, thank you. You know, of, of all the people to interview, um, I, I'm really honored that you would, you would ask me to, uh, to be a part of this. I think there you'll find that there's a lot of people out there that are interested in who you are and how you work and how you live and how you do things. Uh, because I know I was so, yep. Well, that's very, that's, that's super kind of you to say. Thank you for joining us this week as we spotlight the best thing about Linux, our community until next time. Long live Linux. See us. I heard something beep. Did you hear that? Yeah, that was a beep. <clears throat> it's okay. Um, <clears throat> well, but 2011, it's like uh, there are a bunch of others, and I, I couldn't. That's another I couldn't beep. Find- yeah, it wasn't on the beep. I have no idea what that is. Is that like a smoke alarm or something? So I would consider myself not a distro hopper. I, I think I had like a short stint of distro hopping. You know what? Let me find out what that is. That's because fine. That's going to that's gonna annoy me. So yeah. give me a second. Because that's what makes it fun. That's what makes it enjoyable. That's that's what actually makes me stick with it. You know, when, when things don't go right. And did you hear that? <laughs> I got to cut that out. It sounds like someone's sliding a chair across the table, like across the floor. Yes, that's what it sounds like. <laughs> well, let's see if it stops. Anyway, okay. Let's okay. Say it stops. That was a little bit of a pain, but I got it working, and um, I don't know what's going on upstairs. Can you give me a second? Yeah, no problem. Clippy would be the number one thing I would change. So, that so sounds really sad. Clippy for Linux is what you want. <laughs> Basically, yeah. That's exactly. That's, that's kind of what I want. <laughs> Pardon me as I open up a an icy pop here for somebody. Okay, we're done. Okay. <laughs> <laughs>